start with me that every week I made a standing opening statement. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 12th of October 2017. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. Sir, can you speak up? Um, okay, I'll do as best I can. Um, the commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. Specifically, we are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We focus on carrying out the provisions of the Wetlands Act and the Northampton City Wetlands Ordinance. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meeting. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda, uh, other than approving of uh, minutes from a past meeting, has only one case, and that is a notice of intent for creation of a private dog park with associated office buildings, parking, trails, and related infrastructure. This uh, applicant is Sarah Schatz. Uh, the uh, address is on Glendale Road. First, uh, we open uh, the meeting for general public comment if people have comments they want to make either before any case is presented or if it's not specific to uh, any individual case. Are, are there any public comments before we start? Sir, uh, can you start with your name, please? Excuse me. Yes, my name is Erwin Brady, 346 Sunday Road. Uh, I think to my thinking that this meeting should be postponed in a sense because everybody wasn't notified, right? Um, as, so as far as we've been able to determine all the proper notifications required were indeed sent to a butters, people within 100 yeah, feet. Yeah, butters. So. But what about the people below that, that, are, that are affected? Even uh, though we don't know what side by side right that but we are we, that's, are, we are affected by that's the not stream. a requirement so we, we uh, that that's elective on the part of the applicant if they wish um, to notify more than those who are required so there's no there's no legal reason for us to delay the hearing mm -hmm. thank you for your comment any other comments uh, then we have uh, minutes to approve from uh, June 8th. So you want to make a motion? May be approved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion, amendments, modifications of those minutes? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So voted. Uh, then at uh, 5.35, as we're about to hit that time, our first case is a uh, notice of intent for creation of a private dog park uh, this on Glendale Road. And who's here to present? Berkshire Design, um, representing Sarah Schatz. <coughs> Please, proceed. I'm also with Berkshire Design Group, and I'll be assisting Rachel. My name is Peter Wells, this is Rachel before. and Chris Chamberlain. Do you have a preference where we set up easels? Um, probably it's best be next up that wall behind Sarah and Chris. Um, we, are, we sometimes have television screens and projectors, those have been removed in anticipation of us getting a new improved system on that wall, but right now we're reverting back to old times. today to talk about the Lion Trail Stop Park. Um, currently, we are pursuing 
concurrently two, two sets of permits. We're pursuing a notice of intent through the Conservation Commission. But later tonight, we'll also be going before the Planning Board for special permits for uh, several parts of this project. Um, so we're pretty excited about this project because it is improving an existing site that has many resource areas. And we're really excited that this use can be compatible with preserving and conserving areas. I'm talking to you that now. So the site today is a 49 acre parcel off of Wendell Road, it's shown here in red. From what we understand, it appears that back in the 70s, prior to the Wetlands Protection Act, um, mining and extraction began on site in this, in this back portion of the project area. Um, and then over the years, it has moved closer and closer and closer to Glendale Road. Um, the site consists, these are some site photos that we have taken over the last year. The site has a lot of variety on it in terms of landscape and ecology. The entry road is um, bordered by evergreen trees. We have woodland paths adjacent to woods. There are definitely lots of wetlands. And then we have wetlands that we have paths that cross through wetlands, and we'll talk about how we're dealing with that in a little bit. Um, and, the, and the big part of the site that's open today, this, this portion, um, we're going to try and restore it a little bit. We're going to put down topsoil, we're gonna um, put plantings on it and make it also a high functioning use area. More photos. This is the, the gravel pit area. This is a view looking back up at the gravel pit. From this part of the site to this part of the site, we have 55 feet of grade change. So that's a lot of, a lot of slope to deal with. We can, we can start to see where wetlands are on site. Are you guys in the back there? The wetland areas are shown in this lighter green color, and Ward Smith, our wetland scientist, um, can talk to you guys more about that in a, in a moment. Um, also, in, in Northampton, well, in the state of Massachusetts, we have to we have to consider the 100-foot wetland buffer. Um, in Northampton, we have to consider what happens within the 50-foot buffer. And then we're also here to talk today about the designation of the stream, whether it's intermittent or perennial. Ward, can you come up and? Sure. Um, as the commission knows, the, the, the stream on the site is shown as a perennial waterway on the most recent USGS map. I delineated the wetlands last year during a drought period, so the stream was completely dry at that time, but that doesn't count for uh, proving that it's not perennial, but I went back out there. Somebody else has, has provided the five days of documentation of uh, videotaping that the stream channel was dry this year during a non-drought period. I went out August 30th and walked upstream onto the adjacent property that's owned by the city, I believe. And the regulations say no flow. Um, there can be pools of water. But there were no pools of water. I mean, it wasn't not even no flow. There were, there were no pools. It was, it was completely dry. It's very, and I went up onto 66 is the road up here. Where that stream comes from the north, there was a slight flow of water where it entered the culvert under 66. So there was water in the stream. I couldn't find any impoundments where water was being withdrawn or, I, I, you know, it looks, it appears to me that this is a gravel pit, so obviously it's very well-drained soils. Same with this parcel here. So the water in a normal year just comes and basically goes into the ground disappears. Um, I know it's not useful in overcoming the presumption of significance, but I did run the stream stats program. So just as an example, I, I'm sure the commission knows this, but for people that don't, if this stream were shown as intermittent or were not shown, 
you would then run the USGS stream stats program to determine the watershed, to, to determine whether or not it was perennial. The watershed for this point is 0.27 square miles, and the, the bottom threshold for a perennial stream is 0.50 square miles in the right type of soils. Most streams have to have one square mile of watershed to be considered perennial. So, my opinion, it's not a perennial stream. It just doesn't have any of the characteristics of a perennial stream. It's just a ground. And you have pictures of the, of yeah. the channel. city's property. It, the only water I found was actually in some puddles in the woods road on either side of the channel. There, weren't, there wasn't any in the stream itself and it's very rocky. It doesn't have a lot of paraphyte and stuff you would expect to find in a perennial stream. So in my opinion it was mis, uh, mismapped back when the USGS did that. But, and again I'm sure the Commission knows this but when they passed the Rivers Act they needed to come up with a way to identify perennial streams, so they just use the USGS maps, which were never intended for that purpose. So I think with the documentation that's been provided, we're asking that the commission find that this is not a perennial stream. Um, most of these wetlands, in fact, um, were all created by uh, gravel mining years ago, no. and they Why? dug down. Well, that's certainly. Yeah, all right. We, one, one step at a time. This area in here, if you, um, where are we here? Where is the fence going to be? <coughs> okay. Right, so there's a, na there's a natural, is this the off-site wetland here, right? Yes. Yes. There's a natural wooded swamp off-site wetland here that drains down into this way. It's a bordered vegetated wetland. This was all, as you said, in the 70s. It's grown up in small trees and alder. And they, they dug, they excavated this down to the point where this wetland is bleeding through the gravel into here. And this is actually quite wet, very wet, you know. Wetter than, wetter than the wetland associated with the perennial stream. And there are also other isolated wetlands that were old gravel uh, excavations in these several locations. So this, as I said, is mostly off-site, but that's a very natural wooded swamp wetland, red maple, peat moss, skunk cabbage, all of those kind of things. This wetland is alder, willow, meadow sweet, stuff you would expect to find in a gravelly area. Um, The soils are all gravel, so they're hard to read, so I went a lot by the vegetation. I, I, I included all the areas that had more than 50% wetland plants because the soils were just gravel. So in gravel, it's very hard to find redoxymorphic features that are going to be indicative of, of hydrology. So I, that's what I did. Um, any questions about the delineation? Any questions from commissioners? Thank you. So after hearing from Warren, um, after he did his site reconnaissance and we picked up and surveyed each of the flags he placed in site, um, we actually refined our plans. We had a much um, larger footprint of a design prior to that. Parcel 
15 acres are enclosed within this this fence. Um, and then this area back here, um, our client is looking at selling it to the city for conservation and placing a conservation restriction on it. We are also blocking off numerous trails that go through the wetlands in that area. Um, currently, there appears to be ATV traffic using them and going through wetlands. So by blocking them with flush, brush and debris in the buffer zones, our understanding is that we wouldn't be able to go into the wetlands to restore them. We were working in the buffer zones, blocking access to those trails that lead off site um, and through resource areas. There are 0.8 miles of trails that we would be doing that to on site. And in areas where trails are near wetlands in this 15 acre trail system, we are going to, we redirected them out of the wetlands where, where possible. So we're out of resource areas. We are in sometimes in that but zone. Okay, where the proposed fences are going to be? This graphic shows this green line is the perimeter fence for that 15 acre area. Um, additionally, we have fencing around the small dog and large dog area up front. And it should be noted that we are also worried about wildlife corridors on site. Um, so, this 150 to 500 foot swath running through the middle of the site is open and unfenced to allow animals to move through the site. At the front, and moving, starting to move outside of the jurisdiction area, the notice of intent, we are proposing paving the entry road. The entry road is now gravel. We're going to pave that and provide some drainage amenities. We're proposing connecting to a bike path we have a, a building for the an office building for the for the park and a, a dog pond to deal with stormwater and to provide recreation. Chris, do you want to talk about stormwater at all? Sure. Uh, so just in terms of uh, broad strokes, um, in the existing site, uh, toward the front of the site is uh, where most of the stormwater mitigation that we ended up needing to do is located. Um, there are essentially two drainage areas that we look at. The cluster development lot um, receives the runoff from within this property, um, as well as uh, some amount of land to the north here that runs to an existing natural depression, um, which may or may not have been created by, by topsoil piled up from the gravel excavation. It may have been pre-existing before the gravel uh, operation was in effect, but uh, it's there. And in any case, um, it's a large, wide depression where what runoff there is, which is pretty minimal from this portion of the site, collects and uh, infiltrates into the, the gravel material. This main portion of the to-be-developed site um, in the existing condition, again, we have about a 50-foot grade change from north to south. Um, the south is uh, hollowed out into a, a large bowl from all of the gravel extraction uh, with still a ton of very porous material down below. And so the entire drainage area flows over land, over this, what is currently disturbed uh, bare soil to a low point here where it infiltrates into those gravelly soils. The groundwater profile um, varies steeply from east to west from the stream toward the road. Um, in this case over here, uh, there's often water weeping out of the sides of the gravel pit, which uh, runs from west to east and eventually infiltrates in as presumably the more regional groundwater table slopes uh, from west to east. In the existing, con uh, in the proposed condition, we will be adding some impervious area for pavement, um, as well as the proposed uh, pond area. On the flip side of that, this bare soil will all be um, loamed and seeded, which will reduce the runoff that we're creating, which partially balances off those uh, impervious areas that we're creating. 
Along the paved areas, we have a few rain gardens, primarily for water quality, for that runoff coming off the pavement areas, but also providing uh, infiltration, certainly. Um, and we are filling to raise up from that uh, groundwater table a little bit and formalizing an infiltration basin uh, in the lowest portion of the site to maintain that natural route that the water is taking now um, and allowing it to infiltrate uh, into the ground. In the existing condition, essentially zero water with some minor exceptions along the very edges of the site. Uh, but under the 100 year storm uh, in the existing site, essentially no water leaves it all infiltrates into the ground. There's nowhere for it to go. This low spot is, is eight to 10 feet uh, lower than any surrounding area. Um, and so in the proposed condition, maintaining those drainage patterns with some rearrangement uh, mimicking that. On the back half of the site, there is some increase and decrease in different areas of the runoff characteristics of different spots. There are some new trail areas that are currently vegetated that become compacted gravel. There are other areas where we are decommissioning existing trails and existing degraded areas, providing topsoil and vegetation so the runoff from those areas would be decreased. And the net for the entire rear area uh, is that we estimate the existing and proposed, there will be no change in the peak flow rates or volume of water leaving the site. And for the front area? Um, and for the front area, uh, for both um, that we've met, so I, I would say we've met all of the stormwater standards for the front and the rear area. Um, we've mitigated the peak flow, we've provided our 80% um, suspended solids removal, and we've met the infiltration requirements. Has um, DPW granted a stormwater permit? Yet? They did this afternoon. Um, with some comments, um, a, a handful of minor plan changes to be resubmitted, um, and then uh, they've also conditioned that the um, final development plan for the cluster development, when uh, such time as that gets developed, be submitted so that DPW can verify that it does match what we've modeled um, initially. Any other questions or questions? What else? any questions from the public, uh, this would be a time to, or comments. Uh, this would be a time for those. Um, I would note that in uh, uh, public meetings like this, the interchange is always between the commission and the individual with the question and comment, not between people. Um, otherwise, uh, we've seen things devolve into debates that we're not here really to referee. So uh, are there any questions or comments? Well, I have a lot of questions about the runoff, mm -hmm. I think, about the existing, well, they, 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 you want to change it from radial to internet or whatever it is. I think it should be left alone. Over the course of years, this may change again, because at one time, that did run water clear into July, okay, through that stream. The yellow stream that starts in what I call the ledges, which is Crescione country up there. Uh, that's where the main water comes from. What I'm concerned about is our pond on our property. And I should have a concern about this because there's so much stuff involved. And uh, if you get into that and spoil that, there'll be no more water for the pond. This, this stream runs year-round from the ledges. I don't know whether you follow me or not. The, uh, the, the stream is not running now. It's not running now? No. The hell it ain't. Hmm? I should, excuse me, but it is. Because I was up there three days ago, and the water's running through the pipe. He's talking about a different stream. Yeah, different you're talking about, the, talking about, about the other one. <coughs> you're, still get, you're still getting involved in that. The land, Willard's land, runs above there and across there, and it butts Crescione's, and it butts my, my son Leonard's yep. property there. But so, so it, it, it's involved, and this I'm concerned about. 
can, can, can you indicate for us where you're referring to? I, I, I'm having a difficult time understanding what you're. This, this you're welcome to come up there, sir, and point it out. That's no problem. You're saying there's a stream off to the west here? There's a stream up in there, yes, that flows into the pond steady. The one that comes, the other, the one that you want to change the, the reading of or the name of or whatever you want to call it, from Prairie, uh, from Prairie Hill to float is up in here, so it comes down through here somewhere. Mm -hmm. right. And it comes down, and that runs right into July years ago. This is going back a long time. Yeah. But I imagine even in the uh, wet spring that there's water coming across the route that starts in Route 66. Across the Route 66 in Beverly Hills. It comes out and runs through the old, old we go back again, the boot salt country. And that was cow pasture and all that kind of thing years ago. But uh, up until not too long ago, when I was able to get around a lot better, that was still running part time, but wouldn't it didn't run. But the, this whole valley right here is drier now, and every year it's getting drier. The water table is strong. Okay, and I, I think I now understand the point you're trying to make. Thank you. I, don't know, I, just, Did, uh, I had a question. Did Mr. Brakey? Did you see a change in the water flow when the gravel pit was operating, when there was heavy equipment running in the... No, not really. Not really? So the it didn't, was still coming. Yeah. Didn't affect the... Right. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of that, what you say is uh, wetlands established by removing the gravel. There was plenty of wetlands there years ago. There was a lot of wetlands there. And the railroad company was driving over the stream that comes from Route 66. And then they decided to put their cover because they were going over that. And uh, they put a cover. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to have a comment. Marsha Fellows, 123 Glendale Road. I don't know the difference. What is the purpose of changing the brook? For instance, the Mill River has had very low flow. We've been uh, uh, water restricted from May to September and that can change in a heartbeat if we have five to seven inches of rain. The same thing with these little brooks. They may run dry and it's gravel. They sink into the ground. But once we get heavy rains, uh, I remember a seven inch storm we had. Everybody was coming to the landfill because their basements flooded. We went through this discussion because behind 123 Glen Valley wanted to put 24 houses and that one solitary little brook was the concern and I said you wait we have a seven inch storm that brook will take out your cellars and and fortunately it became conservation land but my point why why do you want to change it what what's the, the there's impact a, uh, a, there's a technical definition of a, a perennial versus intermittent stream if it is not constantly running, if there are more than four days, I think is the, uh, of dryness out of a year, it's technically not. That, that doesn't change the use of the screen, it, screen. it doesn't even change what would happen if you get a seven inch rainfall. It's just being more accurate about what the delineations are on the maps that we're working with. Uh, uh, there, uh, at some point in the past, Somebody determined, possibly uh, uh, 
without ever actually looking at the screen, but just from uh, uh, maps and images, that it was perennial. But now that we're dealing with a case that addresses that area, we have to take a fresh look and decide what's accurate. It just means that we don't call it a river pursuant to the Rivers Protection Act. So the, the bank of the, the intermittent stream is still a resource. It still has its a jurisdictional resource area that we have to look at, but it doesn't have that 200 foot uh, protection that's provided by the river. So protection. it's a technical difference that uh, changes the rules that we have to apply. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a comment just sure. to follow that up, to put it in lay persons. Marlene Pearson, 196 Glendale Road. Mm -hmm. um, just to put it in layman's terms for all of us people that live on the street, it's it also determines the difference between the buffer zone and whether or not certain things can actually be built in the dog park. So I just want to point that out, that when you do or do not redesignate the stream that you're deciding on. You're also deciding on the difference in the buffer zones on how far away certain things can be built um, in the dog park. So I want to um, also say that since we're talking about redesignating the stream, um, when Mr. Smith went out there, he certainly pointed out the fact that he went in August and that he went in August last year and he knew that it was drought conditions. He also went in August this year, and I wanna um, just piggyback off of what Mr. Brady said, was he, um, he knows the stream to be um, flowing at different times of the year, so my um, concern is if this was done in August, how do we know that the stream wasn't flowing more in the springtime compared to August? when he knows the stream to be running dry in July and August. And with that, I also noted, um, as it was in the um, permit application, that um, this, the scientist, who I assume is Mr. Smith, um, uh, was supposed to check for beaver dams to make sure that there wasn't anything blocking the stream flow. So I, I want to make sure that that was um, checked uh, most recently, I think he may have alluded to it, but I'm not sure. I want clarification on that mm -hmm. about the beaver dams. And then, um, what was the other thing that I had written down? Um, I think so. I, I think those were the two things. Was the beaver dam ever checked? Does it make a difference if you actually look into it? Um, not in August, but at a different time of the and year. You, the situation you've just described. Uh, uh, would designate it as an intermittent rather than perennial stream. The fact that it is not running constantly all year round. There's more than four days of it not running, and this can even have water in it but no flow. Um, then it's uh, it is technically not a perennial. It's an intermittent. Unless stream. it's so being blocked by a beaver dam, yeah, right? And, and it is not being blocked by a beaver, beaver okay. dam. Both the wetland scientists that was employed by the applicant and our staff, Sarah, have walked all the way upstream. Uh, and it is not being blocked by the And the, the way the state regulations are written, the, the commission, it's not up to the commission's discretion to determine whether it's intermittent. If there are certain circumstances present, then the, then the commission must find it, it is. intermittent. May I speak just for a moment? Sir. Sir. Um, what you said is absolutely correct. The only exception to that is, as she alluded to, if there's water being withdrawn somehow, impoundments, irrigation, which I couldn't find any, or in a drought, which is why we had to go back this year. That's why it didn't count that I saw it dry last summer because we were in a declared drought. So a, a perennial stream, a river, can go dry in a declared drought, but we are not in a declared drought this year. Mm -hmm. So that's just a clarification. Thank you. First time any there. other comments or questions from the public? To, to the dog pound. To the pond, yeah. <laughs> pond. Okay. How is the water going to be? So, where's the water coming from from there? Um, that is uh, one of the questions that we're. And what? And where does the water go? Is it just infiltrated? Will it be lined? That's some of the questions that I still have. So I, I, I will be asking that as well. Okay. Uh, Because pond isn't really, it's more like a, 
a human created pool, as my understanding, but I want to make sure mm -hmm. that. that is it going to be, um, is it going to be uh, concrete or is it going to be, right, that, that it's going to be concrete? Th those are questions I have. No, he wasn't saying right that it was going to be concrete. He's going to ask. He's going to ask. Any other questions or comments? All right, so um, now that we've heard some, oh, Councilor Barsh, do you have anything you wanted to add? I'm well? listening. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions that I've been making notes on, and I don't know if any other of the commissioners do. Uh, but that, the, the start with uh, Mr. Brakey's uh, point about the uh, so-called dog pond. Looks to me like this is uh, being created in uh, a current low point um, uh, down gradient from this office building that uh, uh, has been described. Uh, is it going to be lined? Uh, I, I assume so, otherwise, given the soils there, right. it would just, the water would disappear, you wouldn't be able to keep it full. Yeah, it, it would be impossible to build it without lining it. So the, the intention is to provide a clay liner with then a sand uh, layer on top to protect the clay um, and to feed it from uh, a groundwater well with a pump um, to keep it topped off. And then it would overflow on the, I can point, point it out. Um, so it being located near that ultimate destination point for the runoff, um, to the extent that it does overflow generally in a heavy rain, um, there would be a, not really a bridge, but a, a uh, cast iron grate in the sidewalk with a six inch stone protected, um, almost a weir uh, overflow from the pond to then run into the infiltration basin. Um, and to be carried away from there, or to, to be infiltrated into the ground. Yeah, infiltrated from there through that very sandy soil. Correct. Uh, which does, in fact, as I was describing, the, the natural flow of the water that seeps out of the hill is in that direction. Um, so in some ways it's uh, mimicking that. Um, and uh, while, while you're at the, it, it seems to me that the, uh, uh, to the extreme west off, uh, the, if, if there's a, a stream there, as Mr. Brakey had described, this area here. Um, that flows somewhat to the south and east below this parcel, I was having trouble in, in imagining how it, it would affect, uh, how any work in the, uh, uh, the Willard site would, would affect, that it, it, it seems uh, like that stream is probably up gradient, the stream off to the left from yeah. the Willard site? Um, this stream. No, that's that's right. Right. That yeah. over there, right. um, I don't know for certain, but um, I do believe that in general the topography gets higher in, in this direction. Right. There, yeah. um, I think we have some GIS mapping contours in there. I don't know if they go far enough to determine that. Um, yeah, like yeah, so these contours keep rising. Up, right. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Mason first. Um, where is the dog waste facility going to be located? Near, near a wetland area? Or? You're uh, talking about composting. Yeah. Composting. Yeah. So the current plan for dog waste is a more traditional one. We have a, a dumpster with the uh, maintenance shed. We would like to promote sustainability and push dog waste as far as we can. Um, we are talking with a company out of the UK that has a standalone processor and aerobic digester that would be, could take dog waste from our site and from other sites if we wanted to. Um, that is an unknown factor, so we're planning for a traditional method. There's a, a second so the um, traditional method would be a dumpster on site, brought off site to some disposal area. And, and, and sorry, yes. Yeah, there, there's going to be um, barrels throughout the trails with bio bags, so where people collect it, and then staff would pick it up at the end of the day into um, uh, into the um, you know up front. And I, I've spoken to several vets about the companies they use to get rid of their waste, so they would come and pick it. So where would this dumpster be located? Outside of the 
resource areas. I was just worried about that. And that runoff runs toward the center of the site, not toward the street. I have a question. There's a hand over there. I'd also like to mention that the bio bags are biodegradable bags that, that can be um, put into a waste container and deposited. Uh, so it's not just a plastic bag going to a landfill. Um, and I'd like to comment on the stream toward the west. Uh, we're not touching that stream, we're not affecting its characteristics whatsoever. We're protecting that area now by uh, not allowing ATVs to go into that area. So it's, it, it, we're, we're bettering the site quite a bit uh, in that area. Yes? I just, I need clarification because I don't understand the dog pond. Um, so they've said that it's gonna be lined and I, and I think you had the same question I did, I just didn't understand the answer, was that if it's lined, that means the water that right now is on the land that's trickling down into that low area that's now going to be lined. It won't be able to trickle down through the ground anymore. So my question is, if that's not going to trickle down through the ground anymore because it's going to be a lined dog pond. So well, the only part that's lined is the part that's, that's a pond. And that'll be filled, they said, by uh, well water. Yeah, but it's going to be lined, meaning with clay so it'll be impervious to the water actually trickling through uh, uh, down below uh, the ground uh, under the well water pumped into the pond that's true right but not any of the surrounding area. no i know let me finish my question please because what i'm saying is if it won't go trickle down into the ground i'm wondering if that's going to affect mr brakey's pond down at the bottom of the hill because does that mean his pond will get less water because I don't, I'm not sure that we understand the impact of actually lining that area and not allowing the water to trickle down naturally like it's already doing. So is there some evidence that somebody can say or has studied to see if some of that water is actually helping the breaky pond down at the, the bottom of the hill? I think, do you guys even know where the breaky pond is on that map to see if it, where it's being affected. I just want to make sure we all understand what happens when we line an area and then the water can't actually trickle through. Um, the, the water that's going to be in the pond is not currently uh, infiltrated. It's, it's water that will be pumped from a well to fill the pond. Right, so but it's it, not existing water and it, so nothing changes. But it's a naturally occurring low area right now that it sounded like um, you said naturally collects water because it's the lowest area already. You see, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I understand the question. Okay. Um, if the commission would like sure. me to yes. answer. Um, you're absolutely correct that um, in lining the ponds, um, that this essentially becomes an impervious area right. just as if we had paved it. Right. So one of the important parts of the, the stormwater analysis, which we did include, mm -hmm. is to treat this as an impervious area and assume that any rain falling on that area runs off of it. Um, the, however, the way that we've designed the site, uh, allowing that water to still collect in a low spot that we are going to formalize, um, vegetate, um, and uh, collect the runoff, the, the rainwater that falls on the site today in the same volume ends up back in the ground, okay. recharged to groundwater. And so to the extent that it does support that pond downstream, there should be no change That's whatsoever. What it, the thank you, because I was worried that <clears throat> once you do that, I was worried he wouldn't actually get as much water trickling down to this pond that he has now, and I think he needs to know if his pond's going to be affected. So thank you Correct. for clarifying that. And in this case so that, you're saying I out loud... I hadn't understood your question. Right, that's you're, what I figured, you're, yeah. You're, so you're, you're saying out loud... the requirements of the stormwater permit is that the uh, uh, output from this whole system mm -hmm. uh, is not changed. So, so it's I, already required in order for them to have gotten... So I, so it's on record right now because I want to protect his interests because that's envir it's an environmental impact that we're talking about here by putting that lining in for the dog pond. So uh, it's on record now that you are saying that he should not suffer any effects 
of having less water in his pond once you put that liner in and you've now adjusted the actual trickle down effect to his pond, correct? He's, I, I, let me intervene. I don't think he can uh, assert anything about other than the studies that he's done. Mm -hmm. He can say, and this is affirmed by the fact that the DPW has granted the stormwater permit, is that the amount of infiltration would be the same right. before and after. Correct. Um, that much he can say. Right. Wh whether uh, uh, somebody downstream or in another part of right. the experience is a change from the way things are now, mm -hmm. that is not within his air, anybody's ability to say. Right. But he, the, the goal of the, the, the stormwater requirements are to minimize any such impact by making sure, hey, before and after is roughly the same. Right. And this is uh, now meets those requirements. Right, but your commission can actually say that, uh, um, that this needs further evaluation and then you're not gonna grant the actual change in um, what's gonna happen in that area, correct? Like your commission can say upon further evaluation, like you could say, due to the fact that we don't know what will happen to lower lying levels, she doesn't need to put the dog well, we, pond in right we, this second. A, a, an application um, has to meet certain criteria. Okay. If the application meets those criteria, then we have no basis to deny it. Okay. And, and stormwater requirement uh, and stormwater permitting is one of the criteria. They're meeting that, requir that requirement, we, we don't have the uh, uh, legal wherewithal to say, oh, no, we're, we're going to deny it anyway. We don't need to understand. Well, I'm not saying deny it, but I'm saying uh, it, certain aspects of the project could certainly be, um, I guess maybe that's for the other meeting, because if, if all this meeting is about is intermittent versus perennial, then that's the only thing that you can vote on. I guess at the next meeting we could say that she just doesn't put in the dog pond for now until further evaluation on the effects of the actual land and what's going to happen, correct? I, 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 I won't try to address what the folks right. folks uh, will Right, because all you're doing right now is perennial versus intermittent. No, we're dealing with the entire application, the notice of intent for the construction. So the dog pond is part of that? Yes. Yes. Right. That's right. Sir. Yeah. Uh, what kind of a well is this going to be? Is it driven? What kind of well, well to pump the water? Yeah. What uh, kind of well? I, 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 I inferred that it was the same well that's going to be used for supplying water to the uh, office building and the, the dog wash. Uh, that it's a uh, uh, city water is involved no, with not city water. for drinking water and. Can I speak to that? Sure, please. Um, we are we are providing municipal water service to the building off of Glendale Road. Um, we were since groundwater is high, we were looking at a very small, shallow pack well system uh -huh. for the pond. For the pond, for the pond. so yes. that we're not Just using municipal pond. water for the pond. Right, it's not yeah, not potable. But what kind of a well is it driven? Uh, how, how, man, how deep do you figure? Is well, there any has anybody taken any samples? by uh, boring down and, and looking to see where the water table is right now? Chris, uh, the, the water table, um, again, in, in this part of the site is at the surface and uh, within, I would say, six to eight feet uh, or less on this side of the site. So we um, could have a dug well process instead of having a hydraulic drill. Um, potentially. Uh, that would, uh, I, I suppose we'd explore different options um, uh, based on, on cost and, and water quality, uh, certainly, but uh, right now the presumption is that, that we do that shallow pack well. Mm -hmm. so. um, I have known Mr. Brady for over 20 something years. He has probably the most knowledge around that side area. I have some concerns. Um, I heard one of my residents speaking about, and I know you're not gonna continue on with that tonight, but I have concerns myself of the effects of impervious versus pervious. My concern is with the Barnes Aquifer 
the problems that we had that actually affected Mr. Brakey's property also. So that's where my concerns is. I'm kind of like watching that side. Thank you. As, as, as we can determine, the after uh, conditions are, will approximate the prior conditions. So that in terms of infiltration, whatever might get into the aquifer, uh, that this isn't going to be changed by this project. I don't know if that addresses your concern. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, the trails. I don't think did we get into the trails and just how I think somewhere there are going to be some new trails and going to be some that are decommissioned. Um, could you just elaborate? On the sure. Um, You can see what's here today and what we're proposing in terms of the trails. So today, this is all open gravel pit sand area. Um, and you have the stream crossing, the existing stream crossing, and the existing gravel road, which we will keep as is. There is an existing gravel road that's still in the outcrop path through the site. And then there are numerous trails that go through the woods um, around. And so on site, and this proposal we're retaining in orange the existing trail um, we're using that and uh, a neck of the existing trail up here and up to the north and south and then we're only bringing in new trails to complete loops so that walkers can, can walk in figure eights or a big loop around around the site so the lighter lighter beige color shows those connections additionally we're removing trails within this area there's a, a trail that goes through this wetland area. So this existing faint trail here goes through an existing wetland area. So we're rerouting it with the new trail to avoid the wetland area. Um, similarly, there's an existing trail that cuts through this wetland area, and we're rerouting around it. We're still in the buffer, but we're outside of that area. There's a, a, a mention of uh, selling a portion to the city. As I read the application, I uh, read about a conservation restriction, which the city would no doubt be happy to receive. But uh, the, uh, I, I'm unaware of any discussion with the city or interest in the city in purchasing part. But can you enlighten us on that? Um, we, we were told we have an option with the site that we could, um, we could, our client could own the whole site and either have an easement or place a restriction on the site, or she could sell a portion of it to the city for conservation. Uh -huh. um, I asked because that takes money and uh, the conservation fund has been pretty depleted. So if, if that's a, uh, 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 an important consideration in proceeding, uh, it's not something to be counted on. Uh, to receive a conservation restriction is a couple hundred dollars of uh, legal work and, and survey, but it's, uh, to actually purchase would probably be a different thing we have to consider that separately. So I understood. just want to make sure that's not a determining factor. Right. Understood. And, and the conservation restriction, and we have a draft with us today. I don't know if that's something that you're, if you would like to look at that as well. It comes standard from DEP. That's what we use as a basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what we are using and drafting up. And um, our client's lawyer will work with the city to review the terms of that also. As terms of area, I should note that the conservation area is nine acres. Mm -hmm. About five acres of it, it are wetlands, so a substantial portion of it are resource areas. Um, and if you have more questions about that, we have plans here also showing those areas. And just to be clear, that would be a planning board requirement. That, that wouldn't be something that the Conservation Commission would be required. Mm -hmm. right. I have a question about that. 
just to clarify, so the, the entire parcel is 49 point whatever acres. So is what you're saying that um, Sarah would retain 40 acres for her use and then the city could possibly purchase nine acres of it? Is that what you're saying? And, and, uh, yeah. Okay. There'd be a designation of, of uh, conservation yep. that applied to nine, whether it's owned by the city or is a restriction. Okay. And it's a, That's, it's, this is all part of the application. Right. right. It's not a given. Yep. And it's a very thick document with strict requirements of, you know, no buildings, um, no digging in, in those areas. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, in the back area where the dogs are Can able to, name, my, my name is David Dietz, and I'm the owner of the gravel pit to the south of that. In the back area where the dogs are able to run free, is there any concern with those dogs running through the wetland areas or those wetland areas fenced off? When I, uh, you've seen the, the uh, dogs delineation, do you want to address that? Uh, question about dog access to the, the jurisdiction areas. Right. Um, we do have we do have some small <coughs> and more are these isolated wetlands in here? Isolated wetlands. They look yeah. like isolated. Yeah, we we have some small isolated wetlands in this area. Would you or how about these? Are these also oh yeah, maybe we need my binoculars to see this is bordering well. So we have we have three isolated wetlands um, and two two bordering wetlands. And this is isolated. isolated this also. one's bordering. So we have one one isolated wetland. Um, and yeah. well, I think more so. My question is the the effect of the dogs running through it. Is that going to be detrimental to the wetlands, or is that a, a minor disturbance that's allowable? The, uh, uh, the, the, the assumption is that um, uh, with the removal of dog waste, um, and in the application it talks not only about that that would be a condition of, of membership for the people who uh, uh, sign up to bring their dogs, but there will also be staff hired to patrol a couple times a day and pick this stuff up. Uh, that there would be little or no uh, dog waste impact. Uh, and given the nature of uh, these as isolated wetlands, um, there should not be um, any uh, uh, disturbance that would be in terms of uh, um, breakdown of, of uh, top layers of foliage and so forth that would change the characteristics. Um, but I guess that's a in, in that um, uh, bordering wetland, um, uh, is there f flow that would uh, um, indicate that there's some any uh, disturbance or stirring up of nitrogen and whatever there might affect something downstream? Mm -hmm. These are the wetlands that are the west. Over yeah. Here, um, you know? So that, that's going to be and that's off limits. That's yeah. going to be off limits. Yeah, French talk. And then you have the the uh, the, the perennial slash intermittent stream. That's another one that there's obviously going to be flow. The rest of these areas don't have any flow. They're basically like alder, shrub swamps mostly. And uh, as you described, that they delineated them based on foliage because there wasn't any I, I use hybrid soil, soil, soil characteristics as well but in, in gravel areas sometimes when there's no topsoil it's pretty challenging to, to really see the redoxymorphic features so you know in the core part of the wetland you can see the redoxymorphic features but along the perimeter you just looked at it as sand so I just included if they were alders I included pretty much all the alders you know so I think it's probably somewhat cautious of a delineation, but yeah. that's all I had to go by, so that's what I did. Good question. Uh, considering the sand and gravel that's out here and the very shallow or superficial groundwater, is there any thought about how all these dogs are going to affect that very shallow groundwater with, with their urine? Um, 
I can answer that one. Um, dog, dog urine is 98% water. And once uh, a dog um, urinates, uh, it goes through the soil, and the soil acts, even, even if it's gravel, it, it acts as a filter. Uh, dogs, when they get up in the morning, that's the highest concentration of urine. And they, they will be going to the bathroom before they go to the dog park. So we're gonna get much less of a concentration of, of, of urine. It would be mainly water. Uh, and with the ultraviolet and with um, bi biodegradable, um, we see no effect whatsoever to the environment or to the water table. Uh, there's been studies done that we've researched uh, and, and gotten documentation on, but urine is, has never been an issue with any of, of the dog parks. We've done eight through, throughout the state, and that question always comes up. So we see no issue with that whatsoever. So you tell them the gravel pit with artificial groundwater? Uh, one of them was, was a gravel pit, yes. Um, however, so yeah, that, that's my spiel about urine. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir, my name is Michael Posner. Uh, I'm a, a, a member of the New England Wildflower Society and have been a plant conservation volunteer with them for about 15 years. And over the last six years, I have walked my dogs regularly at uh, Billy's gravel pit there. And uh, I have found some really stupendously wonderful plants there. They're not particularly rare, but they're just gorgeous. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, swamp milkweed, which grew in profusion this year, uh, two species of orchids, uh, and uh, an unusual relative of the, uh, in the gentian family called uh, gentianopsis because it looks like gentian, but it's, but it's very similar. Uh, and these plants are striking and uh, photogenic and, you know, they're, you know, sort of the plant equivalents of eagles and hawks in terms of what you want to see when you go out with your binoculars. Uh, and um, it would be a shame if the dogs were running through the wetlands. Uh, in addition, uh, they'd be muddy up to their knees and, uh, and would make a terrible mess, uh, either in the, the baths at the dog park or at home when they got there. Um, and, uh, Dogs have a tendency to want, particularly retrievers, like to go into wet, muddy places. Um, it would seem to me that if you wanted to protect the plants and you wanted to protect the habitat and the wetlands, it might, might really be a good idea to think about fencing them off. Uh, may, and this, uh, can test this. Uh, my understanding is that the actual wet wetlands are going to be in the conservation areas that are going to be inaccessible. That the other areas are technically uh, designated as wetlands due not to pooled water, right. but to uh, the kind of foliage that grows there. Um, so the dogs aren't going to be inclined to splash around. No, there's no, no. water there. Um, the, the, the areas west of the stream that crosses Billy's Road from Glendale uh, are notably wet quite late into the summer, even if the summer is quite dry, because water is coming down the hills to the west, uh, as well as being very close to the, uh, the meandering stream that crosses the road. Uh, and that area, in general, wouldn't be be hurt very much by dogs walking, but uh, some of the areas where the orchids grow are, are would be be really hard on the orchids. And can you describe where that is? On, uh, in the, uh, the orchids, the orchids are growing primarily in the area right near the brook crossing of the road from Glendale to the back to the western end of the property. 
Talking uh, in that first area right there? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the outside effects. Yes. The second area outside effects. Second area. Mm -hmm. Can we don't have, we're not allowing access back there. That, that green line is the, the. This is the boundary. The 15 acre is it, fenced yeah. area? Any other? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the uh, meadow that you're creating north of the building construction. That's that's gravel now, and you're going to put topsoil there. Where are you going to plant? Um, what is that going to look like once it's seeded? Um, currently, we have proposed a mix of fescues, um, grasses that get gay so high, um, so it'll be more of an open meadow field. We do have some wildflowers, um, seeds mixed with that also. Um, so see, it won't look like a lawn, it'll look more like a, a soft meadow. Also, we, we plan on having a, a, a play item for the dogs that we're calling Doggy Dunes, and it's going to be a, a sand dune that's going to be the size of half of the football field that will, will be contained with, with curving. Uh, that will be the prominent feature of that portion of, of the park. And then around there will be walkways that will contain that, but around that will be wildflower, uh, seed, et cetera, and plantings. Uh, a lot of trees, we'll be planting 60-something trees throughout that whole area. So we're reclamating what's, what's out there now, which is just gravel and sand and so. A, a betterment. I have a question actually because that just brought up a uh, can you adjust the commission? Oh sorry because that just brought up a good um, reminded me of something I've, I've read some case studies <coughs> about public dog parks the University of Pennsylvania did a case study about six dog parks about pros and cons about you know what are the ideal things to do and not so ideal things to do and one of the cons that came up was um, the number of dogs that are allowed into a certain area and what happens is dogs you know run and play and they pack down the whatever soil is there or whatever grass is there and it ends up turning into mud and becomes a big huge mess and it actually does damage to whatever beautifying notions that you have and so um, my question is um, currently there doesn't seem to be any limit to how many dogs can actually be in the area. I can't find any information about if we're limiting how many dogs can be running in that area at once. R the numbers that I read right now, and these are just you know random 350 members with up to two dogs per each member. So in my head, I'm going with worst case scenario, 700 dogs. So I guess what is in place to protect the land and the topsoil and the grasses and things that you plan on planting from getting overrun with too many dogs all at once. It's, uh, Are there something any? that we might try to address. Okay. Um, before we close, any other comments, questions? Um, that had been one of my uh, questions about the, uh, uh, and I, I hadn't thought of the isolated weapons um, uh, being, being fenced off, but if, that I was wondering by the applicant if there are uh, ways to, because my own thinking before the hearing was that uh, we want to see some evidence that in fact uh, dog waste was being uh, treated as the application says um, and uh, a report and attestation of some kind about what, what's being done and, and uh, some way of documenting that in fact uh, waste is not uh, uh, overly accumulating and along with that would be 
uh, some way to indicate that the beautification, because from our eyes, it's not uh, it's not just beautification. Um, this is returning a degraded area to a more functional, uh, uh, both upland and wetland um, uh, environment. And so, to, we want to have some condition that indicates that over time that's being sustained. Um, and the situation that you described is certainly one. Uh, that one can imagine happening if there are not some attention made to maintaining. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, if we are uh, granting this, it's in part on the basis that this is a net improvement to a seriously degraded area that was out there today. It's a, it's a seriously damaged, uh, uh, unnatural uh, environment. And that this is uh, uh, going to improve many aspects of it, but not if it uh, were to get degraded again. So we want to have some way of documenting that over time there'd be uh, some way of sustaining the improvements that we would be granting. Um, so I guess that's a, uh, we could do that by conditions, but I wonder if raising those kind of questions, whether the applicant has any comments. I imagine some of this has been thought about. How, how, how do we think about how many dogs we allow, how uh, uh, we keep them out of uh, uh, mischief uh, to the extent necessary in order to preserve this heavy investment which the applicant is going to be making. More comment? Sure. Yes, um, you know, it, there will be staffing there. Um, this is a huge investment for our family, so um, it's something that will be maintained. And like you said, it's, I feel, a huge improvement to the site. Um, and as far as numbers of dogs, um, I, I, I haven't seen the study she referenced, but this is the largest dog park in the entire Northeast United States, so I doubt any of those dog parks. Um, they're probably closer to about an acre square. Um, so this is a totally different, um, as far as impact, um, of the number of dogs. <coughs> and, um, you know, we have a set amount of parking, and we can talk about that in planning. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something as a, you know, business, it's, yes, it's a business, but it's also land you want to take care of and to be you know to retain membership if you show up at a, a shoddy ugly place your dog gets filthy and this guy people aren't going to pay you know so you want it to be an improved site um for many reasons so something we're definitely paying attention to so and and the amount of used dog parts get the, the most popular time is, is usually on saturday morning through throughout the day uh, you'll get a weekday use uh, at, before and after work, uh, but but it is mainly a weekend uh, use. Uh, this will be used as a destination point for people that might live outside of this area to drive to. But Sarah's, uh, she's done enough research to know what a private dog park is like, as there are some across the country, um, and and parking. We, have, we, we designed the master plan so that we have flexibility of uh, adding parking if needed. If we do, we have to come before the board again, obviously, and uh, discuss strange characteristics and uh, um, planning issues. So I feel very comfortable that she, she's aware of that and, and she's, she's willing to uh, wait and, and really address it if needed. But 38 spaces. Uh, it's quite a bit, and we're not going to get everyone showing up at the same time, that's obvious. But um, for a dog park this size, most of our other dog parks that are two acres in size, we have between 15 and 16 cars, and that's usually more more than enough. Council of Yes, uh, I think, Sarah, didn't you tell me when I talked to you about the parking, because I did not want any cars on Glendale Road, you were going to have 48 parking places, correct? Um, well, we are talking about the parking now. How many parking new grass spots? We have mm -hmm. dedicated 28 spaces. 28 over paved paved over. Over. And paved. And then we have the capacity, if, if Sarah wants to expand in the future time, mm -hmm. to twice that, twice that amount. If needed. If needed. We don't plan on parking in Glendale at all. I know, but she just told me that there was going to be 48 parking places for residents coming in into this private dog park. Right. At 55 cars, or 50 or 55 cars a day, which you had told to some of my residents also. So I have a little concern here of making sure that there's enough parking. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's 
throughout the whole day, so everyone's not going to come at one. I understand yeah. that. Okay. Well, it, if it makes sense. If, if, if there's uh, that, that's not a, a, a conservation commission purview. That would be planning board, about traffic, and so forth. Um, we can, uh, in our order of conditions, uh, specify things that will affect. Um, uh, there are areas of responsibility. Mm -hmm. We can't do anything about those things outside. That, that's the next hearing. Oh, I know. Uh, Thank you. Is there a motion to close? So moved. a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sarah, you want to make any other comments other than what you put in your uh, staff recommendation? I don't think so. Just the importance of the stormwater operation maintenance agreement, and then, as you mentioned, making sure that the dog waste is just to maintain water quality on the site. And uh, I, uh, although it's, it's, it would be a proxy for the true functioning of the area rather than its pure aesthetic value, I would like to see uh, uh, the three growing seasons worth of photo documentation sent back to the commission that in fact all of this improvement is being maintained at the time. But uh, other than that, uh, uh, we have standard conditions and Sarah had a couple of suggestions. Seed mix appropriate to creation of bird and butterfly habitat. Uh, the stormwater operating and management plan uh, with DPW. The, that will include provisions for snow storage, street, street sweeping, and uh, maintenance of all permeable pavement. Uh, uh, the thing I mentioned earlier about dog waste being removed, uh, and while well, we don't need photos, documentation of that, we'd uh, like to have an attestation of some kind that in fact is going um, as uh, planned. It would be interesting if in fact there can be composting, but in uh, in between now and whenever that might happen to at least uh, 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 have documentation that the waste is not remaining on site. Uh, and Sarah, your last one is uh, request for certificate of compliance shall be accompanied by documentation that all trails in the resource areas to be deconditioned are in fact de uh, decommissioned and no longer in use. So, and vegetated. And vegetated. So we have a number of the standard conditions and uh, then those additional conditions. But with all those conditions, I feel comfortable that this uh, application meets um, the standards that are responsible for it. Does anybody have other thoughts, Mason? One of the other recommendations was hand, hand and book. Designation. Oh, that's right. That's a separate thing from the NOI uh, approval. But yes, I think uh, uh, judging by the photos and by Sarah, you walked all the way up uh, into adjoining property, well into adjoining property. Uh, and it is uh, indeed still dry. Uh, and that will only apply to Hannonbrook for the life of this order. So if anybody wants to do anything on the adjacent property or in the future, if circumstances should change, that's only valid for the, like, the three year life of this order. Sorry, for, the, for the three year order of conditions. This will be designated as an intermittent. Any other uh, conditions or thoughts? Does anybody? Have other thoughts entirely. As I say, I'm, I'm comfortable that this meets the standards we're responsible for with those conditions. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I agree. I'll make a motion to that. We've got all of those conditions noted, sir, in the minutes. There's a motion. Anybody second? And a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Say so good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.